Hi folks, this is Frank, this time from beautiful Ortles area in South Tyrol. In this video I will talk about how to implement convolutions under the hood in deep learning libraries. To this end I will do a Python implementation of a typical 2D convolution operation as implemented in PyTorch. Let's go! Hello everyone, this time from home. I hope you have a beautiful day. For this video I prepared a little IPython notebook where all the scripts and explanations are contained within. If you're interested in it and want to follow along, the first thing in the description will be a download link to this. In this video we'll talk about convolutions and first I want to motivate the fact that we need a very fast implementation for these. If you profile a typical neural network layer, you will see that convolutions take up most of the time. Here's Intel's convolution implementation, which, which is called Math Kernel Library Deep Neural Network Convolution, and it takes up 80% of CPU time in, an C in a CPU implementation. Another example has been um, this one, which is AlexNet, I believe, and all these big blocks that you can see here are um, convolutional layers. Um, both in GPU and CPU, they take up most of the time. So it's really vital that we get a really fast implementation and um, yeah, this determines the, um, the, the runtime in the end. All right, back to my slides. Uh, there are basically two ways of implementing convolutions. The first ones are direct convolutions and the second ones are transformation-based convolutions. Direct convolutions, um, are the ones that you probably know of when you learned first about this. You slide a kernel image across an input volume and perform a dot product at each pixel location resulting in such an activation map. The big advantage of this method is that it takes up to no memory. This uh, is due to the fact that you only have to save the input image and the kernel and nothing else. And this comes at a cost, which is a runtime, because you have to slide um, this kernel image across this input volume um, through all the columns and all the rows, and this takes a long time. And this is also the reason why popular deep learning framework such as PyTorch and TensorFlow do not use this method at all. There are two tricks that make this faster by a factor of 100 or even more, and we will see them in a second, but let me talk about the, the other way of performing convolutions first, with which are uh, transformation-based convolutions. And there are mainly two uh, sorts there, Winograd convolutions and fast Fourier transform-based convolutions. The Winograd ones are based on the idea that all these dot products that you perform are not completely independent, but they um, contain intermediate results that you could use um, again for future dot products. And this is basically the idea that Winograd convolutions rests upon. And as you can see here, you represent your image as uh, variables which, which start with a D and the kernel with variables that start with a G. And um, two of the, the constituents of these sums um, and differences are equal and two and three and two and three. So in the end you save computation and this goes up to a factor of 2.5 times less add and multiply operations in the hardware in the end. And these are uh, also implemented and used in deep learning frameworks quite a lot. The other um, transformation-based convolution algorithm is fast Fourier transform-based. Um, in this you transform both your input image and your kernel into frequency domain where each pixel represents a particular frequency and if you weigh these frequencies um, by their values which are represented as brightnesses in the, on the right here you end up at the, the actual image again so these two representations are equivalent. Now if you do this to the image and the kernel you can uh, make use of the so-called convolution theorem, which uh, states that convolution in the spatial domain is equivalent to multiplication in the frequency domain. So we only have to multiply the frequency signals and end up at our convolution result, but in frequency domain. So we have to perform the so-called IFFT inverse Fourier transform 
to end up at our convolution result. But this will be equivalent um, to any other convolution approach. The problem with this is that these transformation operations are quite heavy. Um, so while these are implemented in uh, deep learning frameworks, they are not typically used when you um, implement a neural network. All right, now that we have talked about the general ways of implementing convolution, um, I'll try and implement a direct convolution that um, is very similar to the one used in TensorFlow and PyTorch. Let's go. Okay, so after spinning up PyCharm, I imported some libraries, Torch and NumPy, which we will need, and I declared some matrices, um, in particular input matrix, which is our image basically, a kernel, and a bias, all of these have a data type NumPy float 32, and so they take up four bytes in memory. I will begin with the naive convolutional layer. If you're not interested in that or know how to do this, just skip along. I will put timestamps in the description. All right, so um, let's call this function conv to be naive. Um, and it takes an input, a ker kernel and a bias. And let's first extract the kernel shape. Um, assuming this thing is quadratic, um, we can just uh, leave it as that. And also our output shape, which is simply computed by taking the input shape, subtracting the kernel shape, of course, and adding one. And then we can define our output matrix, which is our activation map as a uh, matrix of zeros with the shape output shape and output shape. So two dimensional output matrix. And now what we basically do is, is we slide this kernel across this window. How do we do, do that? We uh, take um, a counter variable, which we call call. And this is in range um, input dot shape one minus one so that we don't overshoot. Same thing for the call. So we, we um, slide across the columns and the rows. Again, the, uh, subtract one so that we don't overshoot. And um, then we extract our window. And this works by, um, t of course, mm, taking our uh, taking a patch from the input matrix, and in particular, we want to have um, the patch run from row to row plus kernel shape, and from call to call plus kernel shape. And this way, the patch has the same dimensions as the kernel and we can then define our results at the position row and call to be the uh, sum of the element wise multiply of um, the patch and the kernel. So that's basically the dot product. And if this is finished, this loop is finished, we can basically return the result. And for each of these elements in this result matrix, we add the bias. All right, now let's try and see whether this works. Let's just copy the function signature and put in the input matrix object and run it. Let's see whether it works. All right, and uh, it gives us a result. All right, let's test this using the PyTorch package. Um, I will wrap this around a function because I want to benchmark it later. So let's basically copy the function signature from above and um, define a layer which is called conf2d and should be um, an end of conf2d from PyTorch. Um, the input channels are one, the output channels are also one, and um, the kernel size is, of course, two, assuming a quadratic kernel. Now what you can easily do is you set an attribute of weight and bias so that your layer um, contains the correct parameters 
in this case this amounts to um, converting our kernel to a tensor and then unsqueezing twice this is to fake a batch dimension basically um, and to to oblige to the um, way PyTorch handles these weights in, in its internal layers same thing for the parameter this time we don't have to convert to or we don't have to unsqueeze because the bias is always scalar and then in, we, in the end we can call the conf 2 d layer on our input matrix but of course again we have to first convert uh, our input matrix to a torch tensor and unsqueeze twice again and let's see if that works by um, calling print again this time with conf 2 d pytorch copied in and let's try and it seems to work so the outputs match and what's interesting is if we um, profile this these functions with an uh, a profiling decorator then we can see that the first function which we implemented ourselves only takes up about say um, 100 kilobytes so really next to no memory used at all and uh, the one from PyTorch uses uh, roughly 2 megabytes and we'll come back to that later what we also see is and I can't really show that right now because the kernel is too small basically and the input is also too small that the PyTorch function is much faster um, you can see that here the naive implementation the one I implemented first is the red one and the PyTorch one is the blue one and um, as we are down here the difference is not big so I, I will not profile this um, right now but you can think about this um, that the you will see that the, uh, the naive convolutional layer is super slow so we can't really use it and there are basically two tricks that that uh, remedy this and I will show them right now so that we end up at an implementation that um, is as fast as PyTorch the first one is the into call implementation and the into call implementation the reason that PyTorch uses up so much memory is that um, it basically trades up memory for inference speed so this implementation is much slower than the PyTorch implementation and we uh, have also seen that here so it's about a factor of 200 or 250 faster and we will now implement first the, the, the convolution that ends up at this line and then we will get to the actual implementation in PyTorch so the idea behind making this thing faster is to get rid of these for loops basically and the algorithm that that achieves this is called into call and it works by basically unrolling the windows both the kernel which is quadratic and the input patches which are also quadratic into a large matrix for example you have the um, first patch here which is one two five six and corresponding uh, channels which consist of 17 18 21 22 33 34 37 38 and you stack them on top of each other and end up at this uh, large matrix and if you do the same to the curl which is not displayed here you can do one big matrix multiplication which lets you calculate the convolution result in in one step as opposed to um, all these dot products that you have to calculate otherwise all right how does this work again let's call this conf 2d this time im to call and the function signature stays the same again the we extract the kernel shape first and this time we um, create a list which we call rows so the the rows are saved here and again we take the same loop as above with the little difference that I will talk about in a second and we will also extract the patch right away so until here there's really no difference but what we do now is we append this patch to our rows list but we flatten it first 
and this way we basically flatten the the patch and append it to our row vector so but now we have a big list of rows but we want what we want is columns so what we basically do is we uh, call this matrix mat call the matrix of columns and it's the transpose of the np array of this rows list and basically the smart call um, matrix is this big thing here so what we still have to do is we have to um, perform a matrix multiply and um, this basically works by um, performing the dot product of the kernel but we have to flatten it as uh, same thing as with the matrix and we perform a matrix multiply with the mat call and again we add our bias and this way we should end up at the same result as um, in our other implementations let's check if that works <coughs> And yes, we end up there. We would have to reshape in the end, but that is not important right now. Okay, so this implementation here gives us considerable speed improvements, but the problem is it's still not very fast due to the two, two for loops that we have to traverse here. And uh, luckily there's um, a second trick that we can use which brings us from here, which was our implementation from, from just now, um, to here. And I will show you uh, some little tricks that I prepared. Oops. All right, let's, let's start up Python and impl uh, import um, some stuff, a NumPy is your library, and we define an input array to be one, two, three, and a matrix uh, to be this. Um, and in each of the NumPy arrays you have a neat little argument which is called strides and it basically gives you the number of bytes that you have to jump um, to get from the one element to the next element and this works for all dimensions so in a two-dimensional array um, And it gives us uh, the number of bytes that we have to jump to get from one row to the next, which would be 12. So let's display this matrix briefly. To get from the one to the four, you have to jump 12 bytes in memory. And to get from the one to the two, which is the second um, dimension in memory, of course, you have to jump four bytes. And the cool part is that there is a NumPy functionality to change these strides and this will change the view of this matrix but not the data and um, it works like that let's put it um, uh, input matrix view um, to be np.lib dot uh, stride tricks dot s strided that's the name of the function and then you input your matrix and um, determine an output shape which we set as um, six and three, for example. And you say you want to have strides of four and four as opposed to 12 and four. And then if you we view this matrix, um, we see that the next, um, the next row now also starts after having jumped four bytes. So from the one to the two, that's only four bytes. Now, why is this relevant for us? The, the cool part is that in doing so, in a very clever way, we can extract these windows and don't have to do these, um, these nasty loops here. And we can, we can do that by um, using a function that which is already included in sklearn. And this sklearn function is called from skimage.util.shape import view as windows. And under the hood, this function simply calls the stride argument in a very clever way. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, let's put it, let's call uh, our variable windows and we basically call this viewers windows function on our input matrix. 
Okay, now what we need is the size of the windows that we are interested in. Let's put two. And that was basically it. We can now uh, see our windows. And this is a list of all windows that are possible uh, with this input matrix. One, two, four, five, two, three, five, six, four, five, seven, eight, and five, six, eight, nine. And this, of course, is very neat because we get we can get rid of these rows completely um, while not doing any copy operations in memory. Those are just um, references to the original data. And um, I will now implement a fourth uh, conf2d function which makes use of this function. All right, um, our implementation of this uh, function is actually quite straightforward. It shares the function signature, of course, of all the above. And again, we extract our kernel shape first because we'll need it uh, later. And this time we will also um, need an output shape, which we define to be the input shape, um, the first dimension um, minus the kernel shape plus one <coughs> and now we define our mat call again such as above which is um, which is this matrix of course um, with the big difference that we do not loop across the whole image to get to the matrix but we um, efficiently extract windows using the view as windows function from sk image as we've just seen Let's first import it um, from skimage.util.shape import um, US Windows. There we go. Of course, we take our um, image as first argument and the size of these window windows, which we want to be the kernel shape as the second argument. And then to, to attain a matrix as opposed to a, um, a list of, of windows, we reshape this to be um, of size kernel shape squared and output shape squared. Yeah, and then we can basically use this matrix again to perform a dot product, which is a matrix multiply um, with the kernel. And in the end, we add the bias and the result should be very much the same. Uh, let's see if that works. And as we can see, um, we again obtain the correct result. And if you run a benchmark with this, and I have done this and will put the link to this in the, in the notebook, you end up at this uh, purple line. And obviously the PyTorch implementation is very similar to this. So um, this is what happens under the hood in, in PyTorch. Okay, after we have seen how to implement um, conversions in Python using NumPy efficiently, I want to point you towards the actual implementations of this in common deep learning frameworks, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and QDNN. I will put these links in the description as well, so you don't have to download my notebook. Um, particularly interesting is the one from TensorFlow, because you can see the into call function here very neatly. And what happens um, here is what we have seen um, a minute ago in my implementation. Basically, we copy data um, from um, a source, which is the second argument, um, to a destination, which is the first argument. And this function basically returns a image patch in storage order, um, height, width, and depth. And in contiguous um, memory locations. And this is guaranteed by this memcopy function, which is a, a C++ um, built-in function. And if you're interested, there is also the, the inverse operation, which is call to im, um, which basically inverses the whole thing so that you actually get the, the image patches um, as opposed to the column matrix. All right, apart from that, the PyTorch uh, entry points and QDNN documentation is also linked. Um, of course, QDNN is not open source, but you can actually check the, the function signatures, which is also interesting. Now, before we end this video, I want to talk about strengths and weaknesses and why um, the into call approach is implemented as convolutions. 
of course the direct loop approach is very time inefficient because you have these two for loops and all these dot products but at the same time it's very memory efficient you have no memory overhead at all however um, these time constraints make it basically prohibitive um, for deep learning applications um, then again the in to call approach is pretty time efficient because you only have one matrix multiplication basically but this matrix may be very large so it's very memory inefficient especially if the images are large I, I think many of you will have uh, had CUDA uh, memory errors and this typically results from, um, from these operations. Then of course, Vinograd algorithm, which, is a, uh, which uses a trick, um, it makes use of intermediate calculations in, in the dot products. Um, this can only be used for non-strided uh, cases if you have a stride in your convolutions, that makes it, this makes it much harder um, uh, or even unpredictable. And then finally the FFT convolutions. These are often a kind of fast way of performing convolutions and for large kernels these are often even the, the fastest ways of performing them. However in deep learning our kernels are not very large thus they are implemented but not often used. All right. This tutorial showed you how to implement a typical 2D convolution operation as it's implemented in PyTorch. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did or like the scenery, I want to invite you to subscribe to this video or like it. I will be doing weekly content and I hope to see you there again. Until then, have a good time.